to communicate back with us. Let's use it. Uh, second, I'm a little bit nervous talking about reproducible research tools because you're all scientists. I'm no longer an academic, so bear with me with my outdated concepts about what's reproducible or not. And reproducibility, it's a really, really broad topic. Um, we are gonna try to narrow it down for something that's specific for the Hack Week. So for those who don't know me, my name is Philip Fernandez. You can find me on GitHub, Twitter, Skype, whatever, as OCFPF. So if you have any questions for me later, you can use any of those. Uh, Don had me post a picture of me for the web page, but he actually told me that picture is bad because people don't recognize me using that one. He told me that I should use this one. That's how people recognize me. <laughs> That's my GitHub picture. So um, I'd like to start by scratching out that term that we see on the media all the time, reproducibility crisis. I prefer to talk about reproducibility problem. Uh, Probably you're all familiar with that article. I'm not gonna get into the details of it. There are some other versions of that. I really like that one though, because Paul Krugman kind of uh, did a really good abstract on all the problems about Excel and Excel reproducibility. But why I don't like to talk about reproducibility crisis, I prefer to say reproducibility problem, because we have a duty to the general public to make science something that's trustworthy, that they can trust scientists. When you keep saying that reproducibility crisis, uh, a troll on the internet on Twitter say, hey, climate change is, uh, is a hoax. And then they start saying, you see all these papers that are irreproducible? Science is broken. And we don't want that, right? We want them to trust science. But there is a problem that we need to address. And I'm gonna tell a story that happened to me a long time ago when I was an undergrad. I was working with, uh, I was a marine biologist at the time working with uh, larvae from the blue crab. And I had this paper that I was trying to follow step by step to get the larvae from the egg to the juveniles. And for those who know their crabs, they go from the zoo stage to the megalope stage to the juvenile. I could get megalope out in, on the wild and make them go all to the juvenile stage. I could get the eggs and make them all go to the last zoe stage or several zoe stage. But I could never make them go from the zoe stage to the megalope in the lab. And I had a paper that described that in detail. And I followed all the details on that paper and I never was able to do it. I was so disappointed, but one day I was at this conference, I met the author of that paper. I cornered him down and said, please tell me the secret. I mean, how do you do it? I mean, oh, you're following that paper? I'm sorry, that's, we didn't do that way. Like we had all the eggs in a single beaker. We did them individuals, the squares, like you're doing that. And by putting them all in a beaker, we had like all these oils and algae for nutrients and they, are, they end up aging themselves. And you know, a bunch of them turned into megalope. Why like, that's not in the paper? Ah, nobody wants to hear us that we had like a hundred or millions of eggs eating themselves. Like they want a nice and clean image of individual eggs in individual boxes. So that's why I like to call it a reproducibility problem. I mean, his paper was okay. His method was okay. He just didn't wanna show the ugly details of it, <laughs> right? And at that time I didn't have this hair, but if I had, I was telling him, hey, come on, I swim in the ocean. I kill tons of larvae with my hair as soon as I'm out of the sea. So I'm fine killing them. Uh, long story short, I'm pretty sure that each one of you found a similar problem in your field at some point, right? So what could be a solution for that? Like we need more details on, on those papers if we're gonna be able to reproduce them. And there was this article on Nature about the notebook that we are actually using here. So could the notebook be a solution? Like can we put in more details all the software that we are using and on all the steps, the pre-processing, the post-processing, the analysis? Maybe the notebook could be a very good resource. But which notebook? Uh, very recently we had this article on the Atlantic, uh, and this article was kind of a propaganda for Mathematica. I'm not sure if any one of you read it, but you should. Uh, even though they make really good and sound uh, arguments, they say like the Jupyter notebook is a f just one solution and you should actually buy Mathematica and do it uh, using their paid software. In my opinion, that's not science. 
if you are using closed source software, it's not science. It's just not open. And when we're talking about ocean science, reproducibility is even worse. And after my biological, failed biological experience, I became a physical oceanographer, and I start with numerical models. And numerical models, we have the data pre-processing and provenance, like all the data they are gonna put in the model. We have the assimilation techniques and parameters. And then we have the numerical parameters. It may sound like just three topics, right? But each one of those three topics, we can break down into 100 more details and softwares and packages and versions and small parameters. How can I reproduce the beautiful numerical simulation that I saw based on a paper that's three pages long and doesn't tell me anything about the origin of the data and all everything that was used to get there? It's impossible. So how can we get people to trust for example, a climate model, if they can't really see underneath it. <clears throat> so how can we properly document this kind of thing? There are many tools for that, and we're gonna talk about a few of those, but some cases we need like this he really uh, heavy weight approach, like I create a Docker image and I put everything in there, the data, the model, the parameters, and I send that to users so they can run it. Um, we had the cloud tutorial here yesterday, and that was another solution. You can spin up a machine, then you can dry freeze it, and publish your paper and keep that machine alongside with your paper. So if someone wants to produce, you want access to that, they, um, they throw water on it, spin up the machine again, and run it again. Uh, but there are ranges to reproducibility. We all don't need exactly this have weight approach, right? Sometimes we can take a lighter approach and still get a pretty good reproducibility on our experiments. So there was this paper from 2011 that I, I really like this one that goes from a publication only that's not reproducible, that was my case, my first example, to a full replication where you have like this dry freeze machine on a cloud with everything. Uh, we really don't, we don't wanna be on each of those extremes. We wanna be somewhere in between, right? Depending on your field, depending on your data, depending on what you're doing. So now we're gonna have some discussion time. What measures do you take on your analysis to ensure they are reproducible, replicable, and robust? So I have this link on the Etherpad, uh, Etherpad sorry. I want you to go there and I want you, each one of you to type there what we're doing to achieve those goals or what you'd like to do to achieve those goals. It's a collaborative Etherpad, it works like Google Docs. I didn't want to use Google Docs because I'm not sure if everybody had Google accounts, but maybe I should, it's kind of ridiculous nowadays. If you have like similar ideas, try to merge them so we have a more concise document. I'm gonna give you all like, I don't know, five minutes to do this, is that okay? And feel free to talk with each other and ask questions. By the way, all the material so far, I shamelessly copied from a friend that's an expert on reproducibility. And the link for her talks are right there. I strongly recommend you to visit those links later and, and check it out. This is gonna be online on, on our GitHub organization later.
so I don't really want to lose your attention. So I'm gonna freeze right now and go very quickly over what you wrote. Uh, reproducible, someone wrote, data pipeline starts from the raw data. I totally agree with that. But what if you're going from your raw data to your final process has like thousand steps and your data transforms in from 100 megabytes to just a few megabytes. Do you always need to do that? Like can I work with a post-process data? Like satellite images, can I start from the L4 data and, and do my science instead of going to the raw data? So all these things that we have to take into consideration. So I do agree that starts from the raw data, but sometimes you can stand on the shoulders of other people's work, as long as you know what you're doing. Uh, we're actually having the talk earlier this morning. People go to the L4 sea surface data, and they forget that the satellite temperature data is more related to the skin temperature of the water than actually sea surface data. That's conversion. There's a formula in there. So if you have actual data, you can calibrate the back and get be better sea surface data from the satellite. And it's funny that a lot of physical oceanographers know about that, but when they get the data and start processing, they forget it. And this is a thing where you don't necessarily have to go to the raw data to do it, right? It's just about remembering that you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Someone did that already for you. Try to describe well that method, that to describe the provenance of the data. So not necessarily go back to the raw data. Attached calibrations, I totally agree with that. Like, is Joseph here? I think he was the one that wrote that. Did you write that? Attached calibrations. No. no. It looks like something that you would do. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. But not necessarily, we have to, we, we can't be too verbose on papers, right? Uh, those should be there, and those should be documented, and they should be easy to access if I want to. But not all journals are gonna be ready for you to put that in there. Put it in a public repository. That, there is no compromise, I totally agree. There's no compromising on that one. It should be on public repository. If your data is not public, you're not doing science. Uh, adopting metadata standards and conventions, totally agree with that. Comments in the code that are detailed and contain reference and URLs. Open source uh, that's self-contained with sample data sets. We are kind of deriving from, from the same concept here. So let's go to reputable a little bit. This is actually becoming a really nice document. I'm gonna steal this for my next presentation. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, replica, replicability, uh, pointers to the data in the code where the links and publications are. Perfect, I love that one. Commit code to GitHub at time of publication. It's kind of related to the, the, to the top one, and I agree, especially because in that case you also have version control. It's not only a link to what you have, it's a link to what you did. You see the difference? Like, I can actually go back in history on your research and see how you fought your thought process until you got there. Complete and honest method section in publication. I kind of like that, but it's a little bit abstract and more philosophical, and you should act, you can write that on all of those, right? Provide an executable that's lightweight version of code. Sure, it depends on, on the kind of work that you are doing, it's pretty easy, like you can create a MindBinder instance and just run your, your simulation again. So let's go to robust. Holds up in other studies, yes. That is the gold standard. Your, your science is robust if someone else can get a different data set and achieve the same conclusions. Extensive QA, QC, uh, statistical significance testing. Yep, that's perfect. I'm actually learning from you guys. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna save that etherpad and send it to you later, and you can keep adding that to it as we evolve on this talk. So simple steps to reproduce the research. These are my points. Record the project's provenance on some sort of version control system. Have your data and metadata curation, like do that well. Try to adhere to international standards if possible or local standards, but find some standards and write your data in those standards. Establish a testing and analysis workflow. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to do this, but we love to actually set up a project with you and then set up Travis CI that actually tests what you're doing. Test, document, and publish your code. And last but not least, share it. The more you share it, the more eyes you have on your research, 
and the better it will become. So what we're actually going to do here today, we're not gonna record our project's provenance. We've actually been doing this already. We had a Git tutorial, an excellent Git tutorial from Valentin on the first day, and you were doing your projects on Git. So we're not gonna talk about data and data creation because you're all from different backgrounds uh, and all your data have different standards. So it's gonna be really hard to talk about that. And I'm pretty sure you all know what are the gold standards for your field. Establish a testing and analysis workflow. Unfortunately, we, can't, we don't have the time to do that. But what we are going to do today is test, document, and publish your code. So if you have code that's part of your research, we are gonna teach you how to create a package, test it, document, and push it to GitHub. Right, Don? We have a crash and burn kind of demo pretty soon coming because I'm gonna show the failed uh, way to do it and he's gonna come here and save me. Uh, so why are we doing this? Because in research experiments, results are not trusted unless the experimental setup is tested, method is well documented, and we can demonstrate the results, the results are reproducible and reliable, right? Like biologists, chemists, physicists, all the science in the room know that rule. So why our scientific software should be any different? It's still part of your research. So it should adhere to the same rules. Uh, one thing that's important, but we don't have enough time to talk about that, but it's, it's in the standards that Don is gonna show up. Clear code is paramount. You don't need to be that guy in that cartoon, that's not really polite. It actually violates the code of conduct. But try, you know, to write clear code. And good practices on your scientific environment is good as well. We had a very quick tutorial on that yesterday. Uh, this cartoon is actually very sad because even though it's supposed to be funny, I had a script that was very similar to that one in real life. Every time I see that cartoon, I want to kill myself because I remember when I did it. You know, it's one of my shameful moments as a scientist. I had two big shameful moments, that one and when I was learning MATLAB and I used to copy and paste data into the MATLAB prompt because I didn't know how to load the data. I love to share my shameful moments so you understand that we are, we all been there, we all did horrible stuff in the past. We're trying to get better. So how can we do this? How can we try to have these code standards and test our environments and have our code published to GitHub? Introducing Don's amazing cookie cutter. <laughs> so yeah, it's another cookie cutter. I'm pretty sure you are familiar with uh, this, that scientific Python cookie cutter or Shablona or the hitchhike guides to the packaging that's the official one from the Python community and many others. So yeah, it's just another one. But this one is pretty cool, and I know the author, he's right here. And full disclosure, he copied from my standards, so I have to like it. <laughs> uh, what we're gonna need for our tutorial, uh, Don is gonna show up how to install from his GitHub repo later because it's not published yet. He is actually still under heavy development. Uh, we need a GitHub account, we all have that. And maybe we're not gonna get to this part, but it would be also nice if we get a Travis CI account. Uh, if we don't get to that part, I highly encourage you to create that account anyway and bug me online later on Slack or GitHub on how to get that working for you on your project. It would be my pleasure to do this online later in where you are. So for the hack session, what we're gonna do, we're gonna do a hands-on Python package from everything that we have to do. Choosing a license, writing a doc, text, a doc test, uh, probably with a bug so we can run the test and fix the bug later. We are trying to set up some sort of CI system, upload our code uh, and docs, and you can actually get a DOI for your software too from GitHub just by linking to Zenodo. Do, do you have the Zenodo there, Don? Or the Zenodo badge on the cookie cutter? We have to add that. So that's all for me for my slides. So right now, I would love to make that exit and disappear because the next part is gonna be a demo and it's gonna be horrible. So you wanna go, you first? Do we have time? Yeah, just five minutes. Yeah, let's do the, the horrible one. So I'm gonna create a Python package. So first, I'm gonna create a directory for that package. Uh, 
I'm going to get inside that package and I'm going to create like um, I'm going to store the source of my package um, what could be the name Ocean Hack Week package Ocean Hack Week 18 so inside Ocean Hack Week 18 I'm going to create don't use them use your preferred text editor I'm sorry I'm really old and I cannot learn a new text editor Vim is horrible don't waste your time with it like go to your favorite one so I'm gonna create a module I'm gonna call module one and I'm gonna create a function in there Just a simple function, nothing fancy. So if I want to run that from IPython, I can do and that's meaning of life. Very simple model, I just imported. But now suppose I'm not in this directory anymore. Suppose I went back one directory. Oops. And I'm going to call IPython again. And I'm going to try to import that model again. Boom, error. Because it's no longer in the path. So we want to package that and want to put that somewhere where it can share with other people and they can pip install it or code install it and get the meaning of life on their own computers. So what we're going to do to package it, we're going to create a setup. .py. How many of you saw a setup.py or wrote a setup.py before? And how hard was that, to be honest? Horrible experience, right? And when you Google about it, you have all these multiple resources. You don't know which one you should follow. They're all outdated. Like the top search of Google for certain topics are a trap because they're the oldest one. I mean, people have been Googling that and that, and it goes up on the page ranks. But there are no longer the best ones. And the new ones that are the best ones don't show up there. So it's really hard to understand what should I use. So I'm not even going to Google it. I'm going to try to do it that by hand. That's why I'm sad that I'm going to crash and burn. So I'm going to port setup tools. And then I'm, I think it's from setup tools, import, oops, setup, and then I'm gonna say setup, and I can have here like all the keywords arguments for my package. For example, the name of the package, and there is a lot of metadata that can go in here. And you can Google about that. Um, I'm going to use a trick here that's called find packages. And then I can use find packages here. And that means. That means that all the packages that are in that folder are going to be automatically found and populated. So I'm going to tr try just that. Let's see if that works. So now oops, I can probably pip install it from the local directory. So let me try that. It's processing. It's installing. I got something. Not sure if that's working though. So let's try it. No, because you're gonna understand in a moment. <laughs> Why not? So I installed it, right? I should be able to import it from anywhere, correct? So I should be able to do this, right? Oh, it didn't work. So the reason it didn't work, I have no idea. 
I have to go back on a boilerplate setup.ui that I can send you later and see if I import things correctly, if I have the metadata correctly. And when you see a real setup.ui, you're gonna see that's a bunch of other things that I just forgot. There's no way to remember that. And there are so many ways for you to shoot yourself in the foot doing that by hand the way I was doing that the messages don't. So how are we gonna do it? That's what Don is gonna show up next. The right way to do it. Do you wanna take it over? Yeah. Okay. So you guys see how hard it is to create a Python package. Um, there are many different things that make up a Python package. Let's see. Okay. Let's go start to the root. All right, so out of this frustration of like creating a Python package, figuring out the uh, setup.py, and then listing the dependencies and all those things of, of what makes up a Python package. Let me see, I'll give you an, an example of one. That's a good example for a... Can you just let them know how, how much I didn't have in there? Yes. So yep, let me see here. Uh, what's a good Python package? I'll just do one of my old project. Okay, so this was a project that I was working on with Emilio and Felipe a while back, this WolfPy. But this is a Python package. So a Python package, this is the actual module of the package. You know, within a package, you have all these modules uh, that you can call, and then also in order uh, package to uh, be created, you know, you need that setup.py that Felipe just mentioned. And as you can see here, there's a lot that goes into a setup.py to make this an, uh, a rich uh, way to describe, uh, you know, metadata for your packages and also to list out all the dependencies so that when you do pip install, you know, you, you get some of the dependencies and also be able to package uh, put your package into a, uh, a kind of forge or a, any kind of channel. And then uh, with uh, also uh, with that, um, you know, uh, Felipe mentioned uh, Travis CI and uh, Travis CI requires this .travis YAML file and then so then you also have to figure out how the heck do I set up this Travis YAML file. As you can see, it looks very complex. Right, I mean, it, there's a lot of pieces here, and right here, you, you know, you have this pip, uh, like this actual installation of your package, and then you, you know, you you run your package, and then you run your test, and and so on and so forth, um, and then of course you have uh, what's so we we like to use uh, this automatic versioning called Versioneer, and then there's so this this Versioneer helps you set up. Uh, your package in a way that it automatically uh, version itself so that you don't need to hard code your version. Say you have releases. So in, in packages, you have what's called releases. So each each release is like a, a version of your package. And this this uh, release, you can then take to uh, Zenodo and then you can put a, you know, a DOI for each releases. Is that correct? Yeah. DOI for each releases that you have of your package. That way you can share and people get the same exact uh, versions of your package. And so in order to set that up, you know, you have to versioneer. And then also in a package, there's, uh, you know, you want documentation so that people can actually uh, know how to document things. I mean, there's, there's a lot that goes into a documentation. You know, you have this Sphinx, so we, uh, Felipe and I and Emilio, we like to use uh, Sphinx to do our documentation. So Sphinx is just a, a Python a library that helps you uh, create documentation. And, and then there are setup, like, uh, setup steps that need to be done to set up your like, documentation with Sphinx. I won't go into detail on that. Um, and then also, 
uh, with Sphinx, you can have what's called just a, an automatic uh, documentation. So that crawls through your code. And then if you have doc strings, in Python there are doc strings where you can put in, in your functions so that you uh, can actually, as, as you're uh, using your function, you, you know, what's, you know what arguments you can pass in and something like that. Um, let's see here, it's ODN. Oops. Oh, okay. I thought that was a, a good one. Thank you. Oh, man. Okay. Well, that's a bad example. Oh, is it? Okay. Sorry. What's the URL? Do you remember? Give me one second. Okay, this is this is a good example, but the URL is not working. Let me see. Okay, that's fine. All right. So, anyways, so there's like, hmm? you do have it. What could you give me? It just. slash ODN2. I thought that was what I put in. Maybe I need to specify HTTPS. Okay. Well, it's not working. Um, but yeah, there's like automatic documentation and it looks pretty. Uh, so as you can see, there's, uh, there's a lot that goes on to creating packages. And you know, you don't want to do this by hand every time. Create requirements.txt, create your environment file or you know all, all those things and like have to figure out all the structures so out of that those frustration and me having to do those things on my packages you know I, I got tired of it and I just tried to uh, so I created what's called the RPPC it's a reproducible Python package creator and just right now I've already put it into PyPy so you can do pip install our PPC in your uh, command line there. There are some missing packages, but okay. Okay. All right. So once that's installed, okay. All right. Awesome. So then now, when you do pip install, you should have the our PPC. You can check by our PPC. Dots. Oops, wrong one. Just making sure that we have our. Oh, I guess I don't have version in there. But okay. So just making sure that our PPC installed. You should get. If you do our PPC help, you should have a command line that looks like that. And so to. Uh, so RPPC lets you create those Python packages. And in order to do that, you just need to create a YAML file. So let's, I'll just put a package.yaml. Just open it up with a, whatever text editor that you want. And then so um, that YAML file requires a name. So in this case, I'll just say my awesomeness uh, reproduce. I cannot spell reproduce. Okay, that's a long name. <laughs> Reproducible package. And then it requires a some sort of description. This is an awesome package to share. Like this keyboard, okay. Share, all right. And then put some metadata about yourself. So author, and then 
uh, space, you know, name. I'll put my name. And then let's put email so that people can contact you about your packages. Okay, and then <clears throat> you can put dependencies. So this will uh, make uh, dependencies uh, environment, well, requirements.txt file, um, which is similar. Uh, you know, you can install re requirements.txt into a uh, Conda environment. And then let's just say I need pandas for this package, and maybe I need num or well, numpy. Uh, I need I don't know X-ray. And then once that's done, let's. And then I have I need a GitHub ID. So right now I set it so that it integrates with GitHub. Um, so let's have a GitHub ID. And then that's it. So you just do that, and then you save that file. And if you are in Vim, uh, to write and quit is uh, colon wq. Once that's done, so you can see uh, there's a init here position argument uh, init sub uh, sub command. And let's see. So it's if you do rppc init dash dash help, it'll tell you what to do. And I uh, have the option here if you want to upload it straight into GitHub. It will ask for your uh, user and password later. Um, so I'll just do file. And then what was my file name? I think it's package.yaml. And then I want this to be pushed to GitHub right away can choose not to, and it'll just create a Git repository with all those uh, different um, pieces to have a package. Okay, and then this will ask you about licensing. So um, I'm not going to talk about licensing, but there are these are options that GitHub has for licensing. So let's just choose. I'll do a BSD2 clause, so it's like number six for me. It might change for you. And then now this is where you have to uh, log in to GitHub. And then GitHub password. And then, all right. It'll create all this stuff for you, and it'll ask you for the password again. This is n this is still early development, so it's not completely uh, stable yet. So, okay, so let's look at here. As you can see here, it initializes an empty Git repository. And then it installs uh, Versioneer into your uh, repository. And then it does all the setup for Versioneer. And then, um, then now it's populating the, uh, so it's create the docs file. So right here, as you can see, doc source index. And then after that, it creates all these different files for you. That's basically, I am following uh, the UW eScience reproducible research guideline and also uh, Felipe's guideline. Can you open the, the, the repo? Yes, so I will I open. I can compare with what I did. OK. Yeah. So. So like if, if you do choose to upload to GitHub, then you can see it in your GitHub account. Yeah. Let's just do this. So my reproducible package, as you can see, is in my GitHub account now. So uh, let me steal this back for a second. Sorry. So pretty much you saw when I tried to do it, a lot was missing. And pretty much because I can't remember all the details, we always have to copy and paste from a standard. But by copying and pasting from a standard, we don't really know what's in that standard. We may forget to change something. We may be copying something that's not really adequate. But with the cookie cutter, like, we can ensure that what you are having here is the bare minimum they're going to need. And I'm going to open DOM setup.py now. And look how different it is from mine. Uh, that's why I told you that I'm not going to send you that, because you have it better here. 
So for starters, it imports the same, find packaging step to Y, that's the only common thing, but look at all the metadata that was automatically populated for you using just an YAML file. So it reduces the um, cognitive load for you. All you have to do is to write the YAML file and everything else falls in place for you. Uh, regarding the license, I'm not a lawyer, but try to choose an open license, try to choose a non-viral license, like non-GPL, these kind of things. And there is a loophole on the MIT license that may allow for plagiarism. Uh, I can send you the link later. So I tend to prefer the BS3 license, which is the most common for scientific projects. Um, Jake van der Pla has a really good blog, actually, on license. Uh, the, the guy that was here teaching about Altair. So I also recommend you to read that. Do you want to wrap it up? Sure. All right. So yeah, so you have all that. So now with, with that already set, now you can go to that um, folder. And as Felipe was showing earlier, you know, you can do pip install now. Since we already have the setup.py of that my reproducible package. Should install. I don't know why it's not going. Hmm. I wonder why it's not going. Is it because, oh, there you go. Oh, Never mind. It's just, <laughs> oh, yeah, because I put in a lot of different package, the pandas and the x ray. Okay. So now if I want to go to IPython, so I can import my reproducible package. Just like that. And so then as I'm building uh, you know, modules within the folder, so this this folder here is the my reproducible package. You can rename uh, this folder that has all your code. But as you can see here, it has the init pi that that this underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot pi uh, helps you uh, Creates uh, it creates a module for you so that you're able to import, um, and yeah, that's that's what I have. Any questions? Just before we close up, there is one question that I would love to be asked, but no one asked. Should I package all of my code? Nobody asked that, right? The answer is it depends. If your code is doing something very specific that you really want to share, like. I'm loading, I'm loading up this binary sound data that a lot of other scientists might use, then yes, please, do package it. But if you're just doing like script analysis that creates a plot, you don't necessarily need to do this. You can share a notebook, you can share a collab link, you can share a GitHub gist, or whatever works. You know, Remember, the golden rule is actually sharing. Everything else comes with that. But only go for packages when it makes sense. Okay. So that's it. And there is. You asked the right guy because I wrote all of them. <laughs> so there is a GSW that implements the TU10. Uh, and there is the seawater that implements the EOS 80 for legacy reasons. Um, there is the ARC that emulates the MATLAB ARC package. Um, there is a bunch of others like the CDD that helps you analyze the CDD data. I had a lightning talk that I would like to uh, show it up here, but I end up changing spots with Jen. But I can upload the lightning talk and send to you all so you can take a look at it. Okay. Okay. It's pretty much a tour. Yeah, it's pretty much a tour on all those packages, and it's a oceanographic community that's called Pi Oceans in GitHub. We are not attached to any university or company or anything. Just pretty much anyone that wants in, you are in. There is no vetting process. Uh, we have some rock stars there, like Eric Fitting, who is an amazing Python programmer and very good at oceanographic uh, Python problems. Uh, Rich Signal as well, and others.